Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. Few aircraft in the history of flight have been more feared or more important than the Lockheed U-2 Dragon Lady. Often referred to as the ultimate spy plane, the United States introduced this high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft in 1955, at the beginning of the country's long Cold War with the Soviet Union. Unlike most conventional aircraft, the U-2 was explicitly designed to fly at extremely high altitudes to avoid enemy detection, often well over 70,000 feet. Its low drag and high lift design also allowed for a range of more than 7,000 miles. Most surprisingly of all, despite its age, the U-2 is still flying today. For the U-2 to reach such high altitudes and fly for so long, both the engineers and its pilots have had to make several significant concessions. The first and most notable of these is the landing gear. The U-2's fuselage is not only very narrow, but also just 63 feet long. However, the plane's wingspan is more than 100 feet wide. This gives it a fantastic amount of lift and a very low stall speed when in the air but it makes the plane very unsteady when on the ground. Moreover, due to weight limitations and the aforementioned narrowness of the fuselage, the U-2 only has two wheels arranged in a bicycle configuration. To prevent the wings from hitting the ground, the U-2 uses a series of removable wheels called pogos, which can be positioned at the end of the wings to provide extra support during taxi and takeoff. When the aircraft lands, however, it must simply slow down as much as possible before inevitably leaning to one side. At this point, it will be assisted by crews on the ground. Even with the addition of the pogos, pilots do face difficulties controlling the U-2 during takeoff and landing. Even taxiing from one part of the tarmac to another can be very difficult due to the extremely wide wingspan. Adding to the control difficulties is the fact that the pilot has minimal visibility. The cockpit of the U-2 is situated at the extreme front of the aircraft, providing a very limited forward field of view. This design is necessary for its high-altitude reconnaissance missions. However, during takeoff and landing, it can be challenging for the pilot to see the runway directly ahead. The United States military's solution for this problem is to use what are known as lead vehicles. This refers to one or more cars that follow the U-2 during takeoff and landing, 
and provide directional information to the pilot so that they can concentrate on flying the aircraft. All of this means that operating a U-2 is by no means a one-person job. In fact, it takes teams of crews on the ground in order to make sure the pilot can both take off and land safely. Once the U-2 is on approach, the lead cars will follow it very closely to provide directions to the pilot as to their heading and when they can touch down safely. Once the aircraft does come to a complete stop, crews will reattach the pogos to stabilize the plane so that it can be towed back to the hangar. Despite the U-2's incredible 7,000-mile range, the United States has long considered options for increasing the plane's ability to penetrate deep into enemy airspace. One of the most notable attempts involved trying to get the U-2 to take off and land from an aircraft carrier. During a test known as Operation Overflight in 1960, a U-2 piloted by CIA pilot Bob Schumacher made a successful launch from the USS Midway off the coast of California. The launch went smoothly, but the recovery phase proved to be challenging. The U-2's glider-like characteristics made recovering on a carrier deck difficult. After several unsuccessful attempts, Schumacher was eventually forced to ditch the aircraft in the ocean. Several years later, the plane's wings were reinforced, and it was fitted with a sky-like structure on the undercarriage. Though this proved slightly more successful, the ongoing difficulties and loss of several planes forced the military to discontinue the process. Though it may happen dozens of times a day, every takeoff and landing on board an aircraft carrier represents a critical risk to the pilot, crew, and airplane itself. For this reason, dozens of men and women are involved in the process. This includes those on the deck itself, those in the bubble, a small deck-like structure, and those up top in the island. The island aboard an aircraft carrier refers to the superstructure on the flight deck of the ship. It's a tall, tower-like building that contains a bridge, flight control facilities, and various operational spaces. On the flight deck, turn the starter, heel port. Shoot that up each other. The island coordinator, or island chief, is more or less in charge of all flight deck operations, overseeing virtually everything related to aircraft movement, launch, and recovery. During launch operations, they work with the catapult officer to ensure the aircraft are safely positioned, connected to the catapult, and launched with the appropriate power and direction. During recovery operations, they work with the arresting gear officer to guide incoming aircraft safely onto the deck.
Last but not least, they ensure the flight deck is clear of unnecessary personnel and equipment during aircraft movements, minimizing the risk of accidents. Essentially, an aircraft carrier island is very much like an air traffic control tower found on land. Three, three zero to the right, ma'am. Right past heading. Right ma'am. However, the men and women who operate both military and commercial control towers generally have to concern themselves with many more planes, helicopters, and other traffic. As the name implies, the primary function of an air traffic control tower is to ensure the safe and efficient movement of aircraft. Much of this activity is isolated to the control cab, situated at the top of the structure. From here, air traffic controllers have an unobstructed view of the airport runways, taxiways, and surrounding airspace. These men and women direct aircraft during takeoff, landing, and while taxiing on the ground, preventing collisions and maintaining safe distances between aircraft at all times. They also help monitor radar installations and weather patterns to warn pilots of potential hazards and issue clearance for various operations. All commercial airports are designed to operate 24-7. During pleasant daytime weather, visibility is generally good and the potential for incidents is low. However, this magnifies during inclement weather or at night. For this reason, one of the most important aspects of any airport is its lighting system. Since the early days of commercial and military aviation, air bases and airports have relied on strategic lighting solutions, capable of enhancing visibility for pilots and ground personnel both on the ground and in the air. The most important of all of these are the runway edge lights, which are installed along the edges of the runway and provide a visual outline of the runway's dimensions. There are also touchdown zone lights and runway end identifier lights that denote the start and end of the runway. Other crucial systems include taxiway lights, approach lights, and apron lights, which all safely direct pilots in virtually any condition. Multinational aerospace leader Airbus is finding an even more important use for these lines, automatic taxiing. If such technological advancements continue, we may soon have the luxury of traveling in commercial planes that no longer use pilots at all. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.